Hey everyone, today we'll be looking at five of the top rated soundbars under $500. I've done a lot of videos on the best high-end soundbar systems, but I've been wanting to cover some of the amazing mid-range options that are on the market. This includes the Sonos Beam Gen 2, Bose Smart Soundbar 600, Sony HT-S2000, Samsung HWQ700C, and the Vizio M-Series 5.1.2 soundbar. All of these systems support Dolby Atmos and have upward firing speakers, except for the Sonos Beam and Sony S2000. They both support Atmos, but don't have upward firing speakers, but we'll talk about that later. Anyways, it's awesome to see so many great soundbars with this type of support under $500. This just wasn't a thing a couple years ago. This video isn't about ranking all of these soundbars against each other, more so looking at some of the best options out there and what their pros and cons are. For example, comparing the Sonos Beam to the Vizio system doesn't exactly make sense. The Vizio system as a whole may sound better, but they are two very different systems that have their own pros, cons, and various things to consider. I spent so much time testing these systems and putting this video together, so I would really appreciate it if you guys could hit the like button. I don't plan on wasting anyone's time here, so I'm not going to do unboxings or list out the cables and everything that comes with these systems. I just want to focus on the most important thing. Their design, setup processes, features, how they sound with movies, TV shows, and music, and lastly, my overall thoughts about each system. Now with all that said, let's jump into it. The Sonos Beam is a 5.0 channel, sleek looking compact soundbar that's available in both black and white like most of Sonos' products. The Beam is the shortest soundbar in terms of length at almost 26 inches wide, but is the tallest by a small margin at 2 and 3 quarter inches tall. It has a concave top with touch capacitive buttons, microphones for smart assistance, and an LED indicator that flashes for volume up, volume down, and more. There's a stylish metal grill that wraps from the front of the soundbar all the way around to the back. As I mentioned earlier, while this soundbar does support Dolby Atmos, it does not have any discrete upward firing speakers. It's still able to play great surround audio and height audio if you connect other Sonos speakers to it though. More on that later. Absolutely no cloth is used here, which I'm very happy about. Cloth is annoying to clean and deal with, especially if you have animals or children in your home. The power and other connections are located on the back, which are easy to access and well hidden by the top of the unit. The Bose Smart Soundbar 600 is another compact soundbar that stays true to Bose's typical design of modern looking yet unobtrusive to the style of a room. While Bose typically offers our soundbars in both black and white, this one is only available in black. It supports 3.0.2 channels of audio. The front and sides are wrapped with a metal grill, which looks quite nice, and the top has a couple touch capacitive buttons, as well as a metal grill for the two upward firing drivers. It also does not have an actual display and uses LED indicators instead. The back has two ports to help improve the soundbar's spatial audio capabilities, and the connections for power and HDMI are angled, making it easier to connect everything. The Sony HT-S2000 is the last compact soundbar we'll be looking at. It has multiple touch capacitive buttons on the top, but no discrete upward firing speakers just like the Sonos Beam. The front is covered with a nice metal grill, and it has a very small display located to the middle right of the unit. Then there's a port located on each side. The S2000 supports 3.1 channels of audio, which is very different from the other units that we're looking at. It has two built-in subwoofers that are paired together into a single channel. They are located on both sides of the center channel speaker. I haven't been a big fan of built-in subwoofers, but I'll get into that later on when we talk about sound quality. The connections on the back are angled, making it easier to plug in cables, but unfortunately, this unit uses a separate power supply, which may make it more difficult to hide the cable if mounting the soundbar. The Samsung HWQ700C soundbar is the next step up in our list, where it comes with a separate wireless subwoofer and supports 3.1.2 channels of audio. The soundbar is the widest on our list at 43 and 3 quarter inches and has a metal grill covering the front, top, and sides. Samsung used to use cloth on a lot of their soundbars, and I'm happy that they've made the switch to metal grills now. It has physical clicky buttons on the top, and there's a small display located on the front right side of the bar. The power connector is on the bottom, which requires you to use the provided power cable that has a 90 degree connector on it, and the other connections are on the back. I'm not a big fan of how the HDMI connections are placed because with thicker HDMI cables, it's very difficult for them to bend at that sharp of an angle. The subwoofer doesn't feel nearly as well built as the soundbar. It contains a six inch front firing sub with a thin and cheap feeling cloth covering the entire front. 
All you have to do is plug it into power and it will wirelessly pair with the soundbar. The Vizio M-Series 5.1.2 soundbar, otherwise known as the Vizio M512A-H6 soundbar, is the only one that offers both a wireless subwoofer and surround speakers. The soundbar itself looks quite different from the rest. The front and top are covered in a very thin cloth material, but the middle section on the top has plastic grills for the upward firing speakers, and there are some physical clicky buttons as well. It doesn't have an actual display, but there's a really clever LED array on the left side of the bar. They light up in different patterns to indicate the input that's selected, the volume level, it helps with adjusting different channel levels, and whatnot. On the back, you can find the different connections, except they plug in sideways, which made it very difficult to connect to with the thicker and braided HDMI cables that I use. The subwoofer is wireless to the soundbar and contains a 6-inch down-firing sub. Its entire enclosure appears to be made out of plastic, but it actually looks and feels really nice. I don't hate it. On the back, you'll find the power connector and the outputs for the surround speakers. Yes, you have to connect the surround speakers to the subwoofer with included speaker cables, so this heavily limits where you're able to actually place the sub. The surround speakers are pretty small and light. They are less than six inches in width, two and a quarter inches tall, and weigh barely over a pound. They have a mostly plastic enclosure with a very thin cloth material covering the front and sides. You can tell most of the budget of the system went to the soundbar and subwoofer, which is smart in my opinion. If those two things suck, then the whole system would suck. The surrounds are are just a little mini bonus. Before we go further, I want to thank Soundcore for sponsoring this video. While soundbars are awesome and all, they aren't exactly portable. Soundcore's latest speaker, the Motion X500, is the most compact spatial audio Bluetooth speaker. With Soundcore's spatial audio algorithm and tailored sky driver, it transforms any stereo sound into three channels, giving it a very wide soundstage and easily fills a large room with music. There's been a lot of talk on spatial audio here lately, and it's awesome to see a new Bluetooth speaker like this offering a true spatial audio experience. With an aluminum handle, metal enclosure, and customizable LED lights, the design of the Motion X500 screams high quality. For a portable Bluetooth speaker, it packs quite a punch with bold and distortion-free sound. It honestly surprised me how good it sounded for its size, and it gives you up to 12 hours of playtime too. It has three built-in EQ presets and full band EQ adjustments inside of the app, along with the ability to fully customize the color of the LED lights. The Motion X500 allows you to bring wireless high-res quality music with you anywhere you go. You can find out more about their holiday discounts in the description box below. Thanks again to Soundcore for sponsoring this video. Before we get into the setup, let's talk about the connections available on each because naturally you need to plug everything in first before you set it up. For power, every soundbar except the Sony S2000 has a built-in power adapter. This means you connect the power cable, shaped like an 8, directly into the soundbar. The Sony S2000 has a separate power adapter that this cable plugs into. Then you connect from that box to the soundbar. It's not a huge deal, but it's annoying to me and may make it a little more difficult for certain setups. Every soundbar has an HDMI EARC port. I'm so happy to see that EARC has been widely adopted now. In my experience, EARC has worked far better than normal ARC has. And if you're not familiar with these, I suggest checking out my HDMI ARC versus digital optical video. I break down exactly what ARC is, how it works, and everything else you may need to know. The Samsung and Vizio soundbars are the only ones that have a single HDMI input. This means you can connect a media device or gaming console directly to the soundbar, then the HDMI out slash EARC port will route the video signal to the television while playing the audio. The only difference here is that the Samsung's HDMI input is HDMI 2.1, which means it can support video signals up to 4K at 120Hz refresh rate or 8K at 60Hz refresh rate. Now any TV that supports 4K 120Hz is likely going to have a few HDMI 2.1 inputs. It's usually recommended to connect the gaming console you're using directly to the TV instead of to the soundbar to avoid any input lag. All these soundbars have a digital optical input except for the Sonos Beam. However, I highly recommend you use HDMI EARC over digital optical if you can. Digital optical doesn't support Dolby Atmos at all, so it only makes sense to use it if your TV doesn't have an HDMI ARC port or if you're using a projector, computer monitor, or something like that. 
In terms of wireless audio streaming, every soundbar except the Sonos Beam has Bluetooth available. Then the Samsung, Bose, and Sonos soundbars can connect to Wi-Fi where you can use AirPlay or Chromecast to wirelessly stream audio from your mobile device. Now let's move on to the setup processes, how to actually control these systems and the different features that they have. So every system except the Vizio soundbar has an app of some sort. The only difference in these is that you connect to the S2000 via Bluetooth to use the app. All others just use your existing Wi-Fi network. The Sonos Beam does not have a dedicated remote control. You can only use the app to adjust many of its settings. On all of these soundbars, if you're using HDMI ARC, then you can use your media players or TV's remote control to volume up, volume down, and mute the soundbar. There are other important things on this table, but the only one I'm gonna mention is room calibration. This one is pretty important because this will adjust how the soundbar or system sounds for your specific room. A majority of the time running it makes a noticeable difference. The Sonos Beam is the only one that has room calibration built in with its true play tuning feature. Then with the Samsung Q700C, you can use their SpaceFit sound calibration software if you are using a compatible Samsung TV. I know Sonus's True Play makes a pretty substantial difference, but I don't have any personal experience with Samsung's SpaceFit sound calibration. Overall, none of these systems have an overly complex or annoying setup process. They're all pretty straightforward, and I don't imagine many people will run into a lot of issues here. Setting up the Sonos Beam is super simple, like all of Sonos's products. Download and open the Sonos S2 app on your phone. It should automatically detect the Sonos Beam. Then you can begin the setup process. The Sonos app is super straightforward and it's always relatively easy to get a new product up and going. Once you've connected the Beam to your Wi-Fi network, it will likely have to update its firmware. Then it'll ask you to run True Play tuning. I recommend doing this if you have the Beam exactly where you want it. Otherwise, if you move it, you'll need to run that true play tuning process again. The setup process for the Bose Smart Soundbar 600 is almost identical to the Sonos Beam, except of course you use the Bose Music app, not the Bose Connect app. Open the Bose Music app on your mobile device. It should auto detect the soundbar and simply follow the on-screen instructions. The firmware update took a while to run, so long that my phone went to sleep and I lost a screen recording of it. But overall, it's stupid simple. The Sony HT-S2000 is a little different because it uses Bluetooth instead of Wi-Fi for its app. It also has the separate power adapter brick, so make sure you plug that into power, then connect the other end to the soundbar, and of course, plug in the HDMI cable. Open the Sony Home Entertainment Connect app, and it will begin searching for the soundbar. Once it finds the S2000, it will pair to it with Bluetooth and will walk you through getting things set up. The app has some really nice visuals too, which is really cool. It didn't have a firmware update available, but I can imagine that it takes quite a while to do because it has to download the firmware to your phone, then transmit it over Bluetooth to the soundbar or something like that. I can't confirm or deny this though. This is just my theory. The Samsung HWQ700C isn't all that different from the others, even though it has a wireless subwoofer. Once powered on, the soundbar and subwoofer should automatically pair with each other. They do not use your existing Wi-Fi network to connect to each other like Bose and Sonos products do. The firmware update on this one also took quite a while to complete. I also had some issues with AirPlay on this unit and had to remove it from the SmartThings app and set it up again. But other than that, I really like the interface on the SmartThings app and it worked very well. The Vizio system requires plugging in a few more cables, but it's not too complicated. Just like the others, connect the soundbar and subwoofer to power and an HDMI cable from the TV to the soundbar, making sure you use the HDMI ARC port on both, of course. Then you'll have to connect the surround speakers to the subwoofer with the included speaker wire. Fortunately, Vizio color-coded these wires so it's pretty difficult to mess this up. The soundbar and subwoofer should automatically pair together when powered on. Again, not using your existing Wi-Fi network. Now the system doesn't have an app, but it does have a pretty dope remote control. The remote has an LCD display at the very top. When you press a button to adjust certain settings, you can cycle through the various options and it will tell you exactly what you're controlling on the remote itself. The remote in conjunction with the LED lights on the soundbar is actually a really clever design. It's relatively easy to adjust lots of different settings even without using an app. And because it doesn't have an app or connect to Wi-Fi, in order to run firmware updates on the system, you need to download them from Vizio's support page, load it onto a USB flash drive and plug it into the soundbar. Now for what everyone truly, and I mean truly cares about, 
How do these soundbars perform with various movies, TV shows, and music? I ran all of these systems through my usual testing routine of watching a few Blu-ray movies, but actually watched a lot more content on both Netflix and Max. I think a large majority of people considering these systems are likely streaming content from Netflix, Disney+, Max, and other streaming services over watching Blu-ray movies. I also listened to various genres of music, some normal music and some utilizing Dolby Atmos music. I've had the Sonos Beam Gen 2 for a while now. I even reviewed it over a year and a half ago, so I have a fair bit of experience with it. Sonos consistently delivers high quality audio in my opinion, and the Sonos Beam Gen 2 is no different. The Beam Gen 2 has exceptional clarity in the mid-range and higher frequencies. This makes the dialogue extremely clear, crisp, and easy to understand. The front sound image is surprisingly wide for its size. It's impressive how this compact soundbar fills the whole front half of a room with rich and detailed sound. However, this doesn't make up for its lack of discreet upward firing speakers. You can hear it try to imitate height effects, but it just doesn't compare to the real upward firing speakers. In a square or rectangular room, the surround channels actually do quite well. Because this is a five channel soundbar, it's trying to bounce sound off the sides of the room to hit close to the backside of your ears performs better than both the Bose and Sony soundbars with lower end frequencies. Without a dedicated subwoofer, it still manages a respectable performance here. The bass is present, though not as punchy and forceful as systems with a separate sub. The Sonos Beam performs far better when paired with a Sonos Sub Mini. With music, it performs extremely well for its price range. After running the TruePlay tuning process for my room, it made the music sound so much better. This is one of the benefits of room calibration software. It can make a huge difference for different room layouts. Also, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but TruePlay tuning is only available on iOS devices and certain iPads as well. It is not available on Android devices, unfortunately. It's also very convenient that you can use AirPlay, Chromecast, or even connect a music streaming service directly to the Sonos app. The vocals are detailed and the lead instruments, background instruments, and everything in between are so clear and vivid. It still lacks low-end rumble, but with most genres of music, you don't experience this all that much. The Bose Smart Soundbar 600 is another great compact standalone unit that excels with dialogue. It's very similar to the Sonos Beam in this aspect. It handles the mid-range and higher frequencies very well. However, it performs a bit worse than the Beam in the low-end department. The low bass is kind of non-existent, which for a soundbar this small is to be expected. It fills a small to medium-sized room well and gets far louder than the Sonos Beam. At very high volume levels, I don't hear any distortion or crackling, which is a great sign. The height channels are noticeable and sound good, but aren't game changing for this unit. They, along with the side firing speakers in the soundbar, give it a quite impressive 3D sound performance. It's definitely not tricking you into thinking you have actual surround speakers, but it does a good job making the soundbar sound bigger than it actually is. With music, just like the Sonos Beam, you can use AirPlay, Chromecast, and connect services inside of the Bose Music app. But with this soundbar, you can use Bluetooth as well. Again, like with movies, the low end is not super evident. Almost sounds like it fully disappears at certain times. It clearly produces the vocals and lead instruments on all genres with ease, just lacks a lot of low end. The Bose Smart Soundbar and Sonos Beam were very, very close to each other. I'll reveal my full thoughts at the end as to which I would pick and why. The Sony HT-S2000 is the last compact soundbar that we're looking at. Its 3D effects are surprisingly good, despite its lack of discrete upward firing speakers. This is likely attributed to Sony's vertical surround engine and S-Force Pro front surround processing. These are super fancy terms, meaning the soundbar is doing a ton of processing to make the audio sound better and wider. And I have to say, it does a pretty good job with it. However, the dialogue is not nearly as good as either the Bose or Sonos soundbars. It's okay, but really doesn't compare well side by side. I mentioned this earlier, but it has two built-in subwoofers that are directly to the left and right of the center channel speaker. They make the low end sound okay-ish, you know, better than the Bose, but it's not very impressive in my opinion. Like it's not even close to a dedicated separate subwoofer. And I honestly think that the Sonos Beam has a better low end than this one. The most unfortunate thing about the S2000 is that it has no room calibration and no EQ settings, so it's basically impossible to dial in the soundbar to taste. But that's not to say it sounds bad. I think for most people, they would really enjoy how it produces audio for both movies and TV shows. It's just not the best at this price range. Now for music, your only option for wireless audio streaming is Bluetooth. 
and it actually has two different Bluetooth connections, a Bluetooth LE or low energy one for the app controls, then a normal Bluetooth connection for audio playback. With music, it has a more balanced sound where I don't think it excels in any specific category, but does pretty well kind of across the board. I found the bass to be pretty decent with certain songs, but it didn't change my opinion on the whole built-in subwoofers idea. You just can't really beat physics here. The lead instruments and vocals are crisp and clear, but that doesn't make up for the fact that it performs okay-ish overall. I think with room calibration or some EQ options, it would perform a bit better, but it's honestly hard to say. The Samsung HWQ700C is a nice step up because it has a dedicated wireless subwoofer. While the subwoofer isn't massive in size, it actually surprised me. It started shaking my testing room at very high volume levels. The low, low end does start to distort a little at higher volume levels, but to even that out, I just turn the subwoofer levels down some. The 3D audio is excellent as well. I'd argue to say that it sounded better than the Sonos, Bose, and Sony soundbars. Keep in mind that the Samsung soundbar is much wider than these units. This allows the sound coming from the front of the room to feel so much wider and more spread out. The mid-range frequencies sound fantastic and the higher frequencies are crisp at normal volume levels, but start to get a bit tinny at very loud volume levels. And that's a negative I really need to mention here. This soundbar gets way too loud and not in a good way. I watched most content at about 30 to 35, and 40 was too loud for long listening durations. This system's volume goes all the way up to 100. God forbid you accidentally crank the volume up while nothing is playing, then you start up a movie or some music, you're going to scare the out of yourself and everyone else in your home. Samsung really needs to implement some sort of maximum volume level setting like Sonos has, or scale down the volume output. It's honestly scary. Listening to music on this system was pretty balanced overall. Nothing overly bad stuck out. Most of the issues I had with the other systems came to the low end, but the Q700C easily outperforms these when it comes to the bass. It's not as thumpy as I would have liked out of the box, but fortunately there are lots of different settings that you can adjust to dial the sound to your taste. Vocals and lead instruments are produced well and sound very clear. Adobe Atmos music on this system sounded great with most tracks, which is super nice to see. Overall, the Samsung HWQ700C is a very solid system that I thoroughly enjoyed testing. The Vizio M512A-H6, it's such a dumb name. Anyways, it's the only one that has a soundbar, wireless subwoofer, and actual surround speakers. This system obviously wins when it comes to 3D surround audio. While the surround speakers aren't very large, they actually play a big part in immersing you into whatever you're watching. They don't sound the best, but they aren't distracting. And the 3D audio bubble is real and extremely impressive for costing under $500. The audio transitioning from the front to the sides and sides to the back isn't amazing, but it's good enough to not disrupt the immersiveness. Dialogue is very clear and the dialogue setting lets you slightly adjust it up or down based on your preference. Unfortunately, the subwoofer gets a bit fluttery. Like you can hear the subwoofer flapping away when it gets a bit louder or deep bass starts to play and it's just slightly distracting. Turning down the levels a little mostly solved this problem. And the overall detail from the soundbar itself isn't the best to be honest. It might be the worst out of all these soundbars, but that's not to say that it's bad. It's going up against some pretty standout systems here. In order to get it at this price range, Vizio had to split their budget up a bit. So there are some trade-offs here. Less detailed overall sound, but more 3D immersion and low end. However, altogether when watching exciting scenes from different movies, I mostly forgot about the lack of extreme clarity from the soundbar itself and enjoyed the immersion of full surround sound audio. With music, it also performs very well. Of course, you can only use Bluetooth to wirelessly play audio to this system, which is a bummer, but not the end of the world. Using surrounds with music is a preference thing a lot of the time. I prefer them to be playing ambient sounds so they aren't overly distracting from the soundbar itself. Others may prefer to not use surrounds at all while listening to music. I used the music sound mode and it improved the audio quite a bit. However, it is annoying to toggle between the different EQ settings depending on what you're watching or listening to. The vocals are great, the mid-range is great, the high end is pretty decent with the surrounds on too. I will say that the crossover for the subwoofer with music is weird at times. Sometimes the soundbar is trying to play the low end that it's really not well equipped to play and it doesn't sound great but this was pretty infrequent. Now with a lot of my thoughts out there, I'm not going to rank these soundbars, but I'll list out some of the major pros and cons that should help you make up your mind about whether you want one of these or not. If you do decide to look at or purchase one of these systems, I'll have
have links in the description for all of them. I'm also very close to 100,000 subscribers, so if this sort of content is interesting to you, make sure you click that subscribe button. So a major thing I look at with soundbars is their upgradability, as in can you add a subwoofer and surrounds if it doesn't come with them already? I hate the idea of buying a soundbar and loving it, but not having the option to improve the experience in any way. Naturally, since the Vizio system already comes with a subwoofer and surrounds, what you see is what you get. If you want it to be better, then you have to buy an entirely new system. Fortunately, every other soundbar here allows you to add a subwoofer and or surround speakers to it. The Sonos Beam being the king here because it has tons of different options available. As of right now with the Sonos Beam, you can add a Sonos Sub or Sub Mini as a wireless subwoofer. Although I would only recommend the Sub Mini for the Beam. The Sub is better paired with the Sonos Arc soundbar. I have tons of videos on that soundbar. And for surrounds, you can add a set of Sonos Ones, Era 100s, Era 300s, Fives, and quite a few others. I would recommend either the Sonos One SLs or Ear 100s for the Beam though. The Bose Smart Soundbar 600 allows you to add the Bass Module 500 or 700 as a wireless subwoofer and the Surround Speakers or Surround Speaker 700 as surrounds. The Bass Module 500 is a solid option for a subwoofer, but the Bose Surround Speakers and Surround Speaker 700 are extremely outdated with no upward firing speakers and are overpriced for how they perform. Bose needs to come out with new surround options that are closer to what other brands are offering. The Sony HT-S2000 allows you to add the Sony SW3 or SW5 as a subwoofer. Again, the smaller sub, the SW3, would be a better pairing here. And you can use the RS3S speakers as surrounds. These are actually pretty good and connect well with various Sony soundbars. And lastly, the Samsung Q700C. It already has an included subwoofer, but you can add the Samsung SWA 9500S speakers as surrounds. These things are well priced and have upward firing drivers in them too. I don't have any experience with this particular model, but I think they would be an excellent addition to the Q700C. Okay, now for the pros and cons. I think I've talked your ears off already, so take a look at this table. It breaks down my thoughts on each system very concisely. All these soundbars are honestly great options when it comes to the audio itself. There are some small nuances here and there that can sway your opinion from one to another. Personally, between the Sonos, Bose, and Sony soundbars, I would go with either the Sonos Beam or Bose Smart Soundbar 600 because I prefer Wi-Fi audio streaming and don't like the built-in subs on the S2000. Now, if I had to pick between the Sonos Beam or the Bose Smart Soundbar 600, I think I'm gonna go with the Sonos Beam. It has so many more options for upgrading its system with the Sub Mini and tons of different options for surrounds. I think it's just gonna beat out the Bose system. The Samsung HWQ700C is an outstanding bang for your buck option where you can actually add on some awesome surround speakers later on if you want to. Out of all of these, the Q700C honestly surprised me the most. Samsung has done a great job with making their system sound great and has them at very competitive prices too. And the Vizio system is an awesome complete setup that comes with everything together. Sounds fantastic, but is limited in a few different areas. As with any video that is this long and has this much information, it's very likely that I completely missed or was wrong about something. I'll make sure to add any corrections in the description box below, along with the links to all these products. And if you have any questions about these systems, leave them in a comment down below. I'll do my best to get to them, or maybe someone else can answer as well. Thank you all very much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.